And as you see up on the big screen, we're going to continue to talk about Lord, teach us to pray. Lord, teach us to pray. This is part four uh, in this series. And as I mentioned a little while ago, I believe that uh, God is mandating His people to pray uh, like they've never prayed before and that my uh, goal is to stir you up uh, to pray, uh, to not, uh, uh, to not to teach it in such a way. Some of you might be even thinking right now, I pray this is not the case. Uh, but oh man, He's going to talk about prayer. Prayer is boring. Uh, prayer is a, is a drudgery and all those things. I want to submit to you today uh, that prayer, the way God wants us to pray, is never boring. It's never a drudgery. It's an encounter with the living God. It's something that brings life into your soul, into your spirit, and can even energize your body. It is something uh, that like uh, someone has said one time that, that prayer to the Christian is like breathing is to the body. We need it so essentially in our lives. And we're living in a world today, my, my family, we're living in a world today that we need to be praying like never before. We cannot be apathetic. We cannot afford uh, to be apathetic. We cannot afford to be lukewarm uh, in the day that we live. Our nation is in trouble. Our nation is in trouble. The world is in trouble. Uh, I mean, there, there is a, so, there's a powder keg uh, in terms of the world. Are you hearing what I'm saying to you? Uh, but the people of God, the good news is, the people of God, as they're close to God, we can thwart some of the things that might happen on the earth and, and the things that do happen on the earth that are not good. Thank God the Lord can preserve us and protect us and keep us stronger than ever. Are you hearing what I'm saying to you? You know, Isaiah chapter 60, it's a prophetic word for the church as well as for Israel of that day. Uh, but that prophetic word of Isaiah chapter 60, it talks about how darkness is going to cover the earth. Gross darkness is going to cover the earth. But then it says to the people of God, but my glory will rise upon you. My light will shine upon you. And the Gentiles or the unbelievers will be drawn uh, to the light. Are you hearing me here? And so, you know what, does that describe the world in which we live today? There is darkness in the world. There is gross darkness in the world. But you know what, as the church rises up, and as the church spends time with God in prayer and in His Word and in worship, which is a form of prayer, as we do that, our light begins to bright, get, get brighter and begins to be seen more than ever before. And the world who is out in the midst of confusion, they're going to be drawn to the light. And I believe harvest time is here. It has always been here, but it's here perhaps in an unprecedented time in yours and my life. Amen? Amen. I want to encourage you today that even though the world looks dark, Jesus is coming after a glorious church. Amen. And not only that, but Jesus said, I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Amen. The church is not going out of here defeated. The church is not a defeated uh, a group or a, a, a defeated company. The church is, is, a, is a victorious company. It's a victorious group. Is that not right? That's the way God intended. He wants you and I to live a victorious life. And then, as we do, we're going to be a light shining, as I said. Amen? Now, I want to give you uh, something, and, and we'll get to uh, Luke 11. I'll read that, and then we'll read uh, Matthew chapter 6. We're going, to, we're going to really camp on Matthew chapter 6 today. Uh, but I want to give you something that Smith Wigglesworth, I know it's a strange uh, name. Some of you may have never heard of Smith Wigglesworth, but Smith Wigglesworth was a British man uh, uh, back in the early 1900s, and he was greatly anointed by the Spirit of God. Uh, he was a plumber by trade, had no uh, formal education, but yet the Spirit of God moved mightily in his life. There are books written about him, several books, many books written about him. He never wrote any books as far as I remember, uh, but he only read the Bible. In fact, he couldn't even read anything but the Bible. He was, he was illiterate, but supernaturally God enabled him to read his Bible. Even that itself is remarkable. Amen? Amen. But Smith Wigglesworth... Uh, had great miracles, great power in his life, and yet such a humble man, and uh, a British man, as I said. But notice what he said, and does this sound like today? He said this, the reason the world is not seeing Jesus is that Christian people are not filled with Jesus. They are satisfied with attending meetings weekly, reading the Bible occasionally, and praying sometimes. It is an awful thing for me to see people who profess to be Christians, lifeless, powerless, and in a place where their lives are so parallel to unbelievers' lives that it is difficult to tell which place they are in, whether in the flesh or in the spirits. 
It sounds like the same it is today, the same as it is today. He said they are satisfied. I think the church in America is very much in this, in this state. They are satisfied with attending meetings weekly, reading the Bible once in a while, praying sometimes, but they had no power. They're now filled uh, with the Spirit of God. We need to be filled with the Spirit of God. You may say, well, I've got too many problems. I've got too many situations in my life. I've got too many burdens in my life uh, to really uh, pour out my soul to God, uh, to really spend time in the Word. I've got too much to do over here and over there. I'm too busy to pray. I'm too busy uh, to be involved. I'm too busy to be in the Word of God. I submit to you today uh, that as long as you are too busy doing those things, you will remain too busy. One thing I found, the more I'm with God in prayer and the Word and serving Him, the more time I had to do everything else. It's amazing to me. Amen. It's like that, that principle of sowing and reaping. As you sow your time in serving the Lord, serving here is a form of serving the Lord or whatever, uh, serving Him, praying in the Word of God. As you sow your time in those things, you'll find out you've got time uh, for every, every other thing that you've got to do. You have time because you sowed and the time is redeemed. You're redeeming the time as the Apostle Paul said. Some of you don't believe it, but I believe you will. Amen. Some things, are, some things are believed as you begin to act, as you begin to do it, as you begin to be a doer of the Word of God. You find out these things by, by, uh, by experiencing these things more than being convinced by what someone says. Amen. Now, before we read the Scriptures, let's pray and ask God to help us today. Heavenly Father, we give you glory and honor today. And Father God, my prayer is that this, your congregation, Father God, would not be those that are satisfied. We're just coming and meeting once a week or twice a week. That we would not be satisfied occasionally reading the Bible or even once in a while praying. Uh, Father God, that we would not be satisfied, Father, but that you would put within each and every one of us a, a desire, a, a, just a, a strong desire uh, to be close to you, to know you, to serve you, to get into the Word of God, to pray, to seek your face. Father God, I pray that as we delve into the Word of God, that the Word of God will not just uh, uh, be a bunch of information, but they'll also to be an impartation into our lives. Uh, Father God, that there won't be just uh, the command of the word, but there'll be an impartation of desire that comes along with that command. Father, I'm praying uh, for changed lives in this place today. Changed lives amongst everyone here, including myself, that our lives would be different this year than they've ever been before because we are, uh, we are closer to you than we've ever been, Father God. Help us and, and fill us afresh uh, with Jesus. Fill us, uh, fill us afresh uh, with your spirit, Father God. We thank you and believe you for these things by faith. In Jesus' name. And everybody said, Amen. Amen. In Luke's Gospel, our main text, and you are in Matthew chapter 6, but Luke's Gospel up on the big screen reads this way. Luke 11 verses 1 through 4, it reads this way. Now it came to pass as he, that's Jesus, was praying in a certain place when he ceased that one of his disciples said to him, Lord, teach us to pray. Uh, two weeks ago, I, I wasn't here last week. Most of you know that uh, Pastor Doug uh, Mitchell was here. I hope you enjoyed Pastor Doug. Was he a blessing? Amen. Amen. I, I'm asking you that because I didn't listen to the message yet, but I trust it was good. Amen? Amen. And, and so two weeks ago, as I read this particular this particular uh, uh, phrase, Lord, teach us to pray. I said, let's pray that together. Let's say it together right now. Lord, teach us to pray. One more time. Lord, teach us to pray. And that should be our prayer, to teach us to pray and to inspire us and to put within us a desire to pray. Let's read out. As John also taught his disciples, so he, Jesus, said to them, when you pray, say, our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us day by day our daily bread and forgive us our sins for we also forgive everyone who is indebted to us and do not lead us into temptation but deliver us from the evil one. And so we see here that this particular time when Jesus is uh, there with his disciples and he teaches on what we commonly refer to as the Lord's Prayer, it is, it is uh, 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 predicated by the question or the request I should say of Lord teach us to pray. Now, in Matthew's Gospel, chapter 6, we have a portion of what is commonly referred to as the Sermon on the Mount. And it gives a record of what Jesus is teaching here in terms of the Lord's Prayer as well. But the background of it is a little bit different. Now, one thing I want to say to you is this. Sometimes people uh, that don't believe in the inspiration of the Bible, they get all caught up with this idea of why is the, is the context of Luke chapter 11, for example, with the Lord's Prayer, and the context of Matthew chapter 6, why is it different? Well, the, the logical answer to that is that Jesus taught it at different times. 
Would you agree with me that it makes sense that Jesus didn't just teach certain things one time during the course of three and a half years of the ministry? And most scholars would agree that he taught about the Lord's Prayer, as we call it, uh, this uh, aspect of prayer. He taught about it more than one time to his disciples in that three and a half year span. I think prayer was probably in Jesus' mind important enough to talk about more than one time, wouldn't you say? And so the background here in Matthew 6 is a little bit different. There's no uh, record of them asking them, him, uh, Lord, teach us to pray, uh, because this is a different time. This is a different event where he's sharing these things again. And so it's important for us uh, to see that background. Now, in Matthew chapter 6, beginning with verse 5, are you there? It reads this way. We're going to read all the way through verse 13. Then we're going to expound on some of these things here today. Matthew chapter 6, beginning with verse 5. And when you pray, this is Jesus giving some instruction. And when you pray, you shall not be like the hypocrites. For they love to pray standing in the synagogues and on the, on the corners of the streets that they may be seen by men. Assuredly, I say to you, they have their reward. But you, when you pray, notice it didn't say if you pray. It says when you pray... Go into your room, and when you have shut your door, pray to your Father who is in the secret place, and your Father who sees in secret will reward you openly. And when you pray, do not use vain repetitions as the heathen do, for they think that they will be heard for their many words. Verse 8, therefore do not be like them, for your Father knows the things you have need of, or uh, things that you have need of, I'm sorry, before you ask Him. Verse 9, in this manner therefore pray, our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And do not lead us into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Now, as we look at this passage of Scripture, we want to do this verse by verse. We want to look at some truths uh, that we're going to discover from verse 5 on through uh, to verse 13. We're going to see some things, and I'm going to uh, try to, by the grace of God, break apart a few things and help you see that this prayer that Jesus proposed to the disciples was never intended uh, to be a prayer that was repeated time and time again. It was not meant to be a prayer. It was meant to be a model for prayer or a pattern for prayer. And you and I are going to discover the basic pattern that Jesus gives them and submits to them. And we're going to learn from it and see how we really are to uh, apply this Lord's Prayer uh, into our lives today. Would that be all right today? Is everybody with me? All right. And so first of all, notice beginning with verses 5 through 8. As you look up at the big screen and as you follow and remember as we've already read these verses, he talks first and foremost to them about preparing to pray. He gives them some keys for preparing to pray before he actually gives them a model of prayer. And so let's notice some things. First of all, verse 5. Notice what he said. Don't pray to be seen and praised by people. Don't pray to be seen and praised by people is the first thing that he says. What's he trying to avoid? He's trying to avoid the wrong motivation in prayer. A lot of folks, uh, they pray to be seen. They pray to look spiritual. They pray uh, to look pious. They pray uh, to impress others. And, and certainly the Pharisees of his day and, and possibly the Sadducees, but the Pharisees, the religious leaders of Jesus' day, they were known to do that kind of praying. Are you with me? We're talking about religious prayers. We're talking about praying for the show of it. We're not talking about meaningful prayers. We're not talking about prayers from the heart. We're not talking about uh, prayers of faith. We're talking about just going through some kind of ritualistic, religious kind of prayer just to look pious and look uh, uh, like you know something or whatever and you've got some kind of connection with God. But how many of you know that none of that's going to cut it? Isn't that right? Real prayer is not something that we do just to be seen or to be uh, you know, pious or to appear pious to others. Real prayer is something that we uh, carry out because we want to be close to God. We love God. Every motivation as a believer is supposed to be the motivation of a love, number one, for God. Are you hearing me here today? Yeah. That's our motivation. When you uh, think about motivation, uh, automatically everything that has to do with motivation in the Christian life ought to be for love. When we give our tithes and offerings, why do we give our tithes and offerings? We give it out of love, first of all, for the Lord, don't we? 
That's, that's supposed to be our motive. Why do, we, why do we give it? Out of love for the Lord and then love for people because uh, the gospel is for people to hear and to be uh, discipled in and all those various things. And so whatever that might be, we do it out of love for God. When we come to church on Sunday morning or Thursday night or whatever it is that we come, we're not doing it out of a, out of a motivation of just going through the ritual. We shouldn't be. Or going through the action or in order to uh, tell people, well, I go to church every Sunday. I'm pious. I'm religious. How many of you know that that doesn't cut it? No, we are to come to church. I pray that you come to church on Sunday mornings because you love God. You love His Word. You love the people of God. That's our motivation in coming to church. Amen? Amen? That should be our motivation. And so it's always supposed to be out of a love for God first and love for other people. Right? And that includes this aspect of prayer. That includes our praise and worship. I mean, I could go on and on about our various actions. You, you know, when you, when you love God, you want to praise Him. When you love God, you want to worship Him. Amen? Yeah. And not just when we gather together. You want to praise Him when you're at home. You want to worship Him when you're at home. Amen? And, and even praying at home and, and all of these kinds of things, these are a motivation out of love. Love is supposed to be the Christian's motivation uh, for these things. And so Jesus says, don't pray to be seen and praised by people. He says to them in that context, because if you do that, you have your reward. Your reward will be a man. The, the reward of men will be a pat on the back. Oh, look how pious He is. Look how religious he is, uh, but that will not be the true rewards that you receive from your heavenly father. Amen? Amen. 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 Now we go on to verse 6. Find a place. He says this in verse 6, just looking at it again. He says, but you, when you pray, go into your room. And when you have shut your door, pray to your father who is in secret place. And your father who sees in secret will reward you openly. It, it basically is said, uh, find a place and a time to pray. You know, that's a healthy thing to do. Now, this is not saying that you never pray publicly, but what he is saying, it still has to do really with motivation. He is making a point here that when you pray, do it, uh, to, do, do it not to be seen a man and, and, and avoid the appearance of piety that is not real. And then he goes on with that and says, find a place where you can pray. It doesn't mean you can't pray publicly because there's a lot of other scriptures that tell us there's a time to pray, right? Amen. A time to pray in public. One example uh, of that is 1 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 8. You can write it down. You don't have to turn there. But it talks about praying publicly. It says, I, 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 uh, uh, I, I say that men should pray everywhere with hands lifted up. Are, are you hearing what I'm saying? And so there's many scriptures that talk about public prayer. But the key is this. If you're not praying uh, privately, then why are you praying publicly? Are you understanding me here? In other words, it's more apt to be real genuine prayer when you're praying publicly if you are a praying person in private. Yeah. Yeah. Same thing with praise and worship. It's more apt to be a, 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 a real genuine praise and worship in public if you are genuinely praising and worshiping God in your private life. Amen? Amen. Anything we do in public in this respect, it, it ought to be an outflow of what we do in our personal life. Amen? Yeah. Including the Word of God as well. And so that's something that he said. Find a place and time to pray. And, and as I was pondering that particular point, I got thinking about this as well. That, you know, a lot of times, you know, people have that idea, I have to find a place and time to pray every day. Daily, I need to find a place and time to pray. I want to submit uh, this thought to you. You know, I realize that that's a new thing for a lot of folks, and it's a hard thing uh, for folks to do. You know, it's kind of like, you know, you haven't ran in... 20 years and now you're going to run uh, five miles or something. You know, you just can't do that without hurting yourself. Isn't that right? Yeah. Yeah. Amen. And you would probably die long before you got even close to five miles if you haven't ran in 20 years. Amen. And, and so, you know, when we talk about praying and setting aside time to pray, you know, we have to take these in bite-sized pieces. Just start uh, setting a little bit of time apart, maybe just once a week where you really set time apart. But really, prayer should be a lifestyle. You can pray, as I mentioned before, in your car. A couple of weeks ago, I mentioned you can pray in your car. You can pray in your, you, you know, where you're making breakfast. You can pray, you know, whenever. It ought to be a lifestyle of prayer, right? But yet there is a value in setting aside a time for prayer where you just get alone with your Bible. Your Bible might say, uh, go into your closet. You don't have to literally go into a closet. Go into a place that's private of it and spend some time with God once a week for 10 minutes once a week for 15 minutes to start with take it in bite sized pieces where you get alone with God yeah. does that make sense to you yes. don't try to run a marathon when, when you can't hardly you know walk to the mailbox 
You follow what I'm saying to you? All right, and so we have to we have to work up to these things and and what have you. Now, as we go on uh, with some of this as well, again, verse seven. Now, don't pray with vain repetitions. Notice what verse seven says. It says, "And when you pray, do not use vain repetitions as the heathen do, or those of other religions might do. Don't pray with vain repetitions, for they think that they will be heard for their many words." Notice what the Amplified Bible says. It's up on the big screen. It says it this way: "And when you pray, do not heap up phrases, multiply words, repeating the same ones." over and over as the Gentiles do, for they think they'll be heard for their much speaking. You know, it's really ironic that after having said that, vain repetitions, the church in many regards had taken the very prayer Jesus talks about after this, and they've made it into a vain repetition. Am I speaking to the right people here today? And so they've done the exact thing right in the context of Matthew 6 where Jesus said, don't make it vain repetitions. They have prayed over and over again. Our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, etc. As a vain repetition with no meaning and with no heart. It's just something that they're parroting off like a parrot would. Isn't that right? But Jesus never intended it to be that way. He never intended this, this Lord's Prayer uh, to just be repeated over and over and over again like a, some sort of, a, some sort of a incantation that's going to uh, cause God to do some kind of miraculous thing in our lives or whatever. God never intended for this to be repeated over and over and over again. Now, I know that might blow your theology, but nevertheless, didn't Jesus say, don't do it over and over, repeating the same ones over and over and over and over and over again. Because why? That loses its meaning. It doesn't have a sense of genuineness to it. People just, I remember growing up in in my uh, mainline church and we prayed that prayer. And it had no meaning. It really didn't mean anything. It's just something we did. We went through the motions. We don't want to be people just going through the motions, do we? All right. And so going on with this as we're preparing to pray, as I said, verse 8, rest in your relationship. Notice what Jesus said in verse 8. Therefore, do not be like them for your father. Say my father. How many of you know that's relationship right there? Amen. He said your father knows the things you have need of before you ask him. And so again, rest in your relationship with God. He's your heavenly Father. When having to do with prayer, rest in the fact that He is your Daddy. He's your Abba Father. He loves you with an unconditional love. That is really, in many regards, the foundation of our prayer life. Knowing we have a heavenly Father who knows what we need need before we even ask. You know, it's amazing if you read this in context, you know, don't go too far, but just a little bit further on into this same chapter. Notice what it says, Jesus uh, saying this in verse 32, after he said about the idea of seeking first the kingdom of God. Well, he says that after this, but he talks about take no thought, don't worry about what you're going to wear, what you're going to eat, all these various things. He said, take no thought, don't worry about those things. Why? Because in verse 32, he says, for after all these things, the Gentiles seek, for your heavenly Father knows that you need all these things. So the Father knows, doesn't he? Now, some people ask this question. Uh, You'll you'll notice, uh, first of all, Jesus reminds us that God is our Father. As such, he knows what we need before we ask, and he's concerned that our needs be met. Do you believe he's concerned about you today? Now, notice a lot of people, though, ask this question or similar question. If God already knows what we need, then what is the point of praying? How many of you wondered that? Don't raise your hand. But how many of you wondered that? Just as I was teaching this and saying and and quoting two verses in chapter 6 of Matthew that say that God knows what you need before you even ask. How many of you were thinking, don't raise your hand, but how many of you were thinking, what's the point in praying if God already knows? A lot of people wonder that, uh, but I have two answers for that. Number one, prayer helps the believer by giving them the opportunity to express their love for him, their dependence upon him, and their faith in him. So number one, as we ask God in prayer, in terms of whatever it is we're praying for, or even just uh, fellowshipping with God in prayer, it's helping us to remember that we depend upon him. It's helping us to remember we need God. And so prayer is not just for us to reach out to God in order to receive something from God. Prayer helps us. Prayer helps us get focused, doesn't it? Prayer helps us get off of those things that are going on around us and get our hearts and minds set on God instead, right? And then how about this one? God doesn't force himself into people's lives. He must be invited to intervene. Prayers not prayed will be prayers not answered. James 4, 2 says, you have not because you ask not, right? And so the thing about God, as it states there, is God doesn't force himself into people's lives. 
That's not the way our God operates. He doesn't work that way, right? He didn't force you to get saved, did he? He didn't force you to do anything. He didn't force you to come to church today. He, it doesn't for, he doesn't force you to read your Bible. He doesn't force you to give your tithes and offerings. I prayed. I've asked them. Force them to give their tithes and offerings. And it didn't work. I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. I just kid. But, but the point is, where do these things come from? But anyway, but the point is, God wants to be invited into our lives. And by way of prayer, we are, we are essentially doing that. We're inviting him to intervene and to have a part of what we're doing in our lives. And so even though he already knows, we need to ask. Amen. All right, so preparing to pray. As we look at some more, verse 8, rely on his resources. I already said rely on your relationship with him. He is your father. But then also rely on his resources. As we know in so many scriptures, Hebrews eleven six 6, and Matthew 21, 22, and James 1. Let me just read what it says here first. Since he is God, and since he is our father, we can go to him in confidence and faith, believing that he has the power to answer us when we call upon him. Faith in God through prayer is essential to prayers being answered. And we could give a whole lot of other examples, but Hebrews eleven six 6 is one of my favorites. It says this. It says, it says this. It says, he that comes to God must believe that he is and believe that he is the rewarder of those that diligently seek him. Amen? So he's a rewarder, isn't he? But he's a rewarder of those that diligently seek him by faith. Amen? And so again, preparing to pray. Jesus in this passage of Matthew chapter 6, he's preparing them, giving them ideas about prayer. Really preparing us in our hearts in order to pray first and foremost. Amen? Are you getting anything out of this today? All right, so if, if you aren't, just pretend you do. It'll help the preacher. Preaching will be better if you pretend you're getting something out of this today, all right? All right, now, I'm just kidding with you, but i got to do something to get some reaction. All right, so, notice now, in this prayer called the Lord's Prayer, six parts to this prayer that I've broken down here. And, you know, many years ago, back in the 80s, some of you might remember this gentleman. He was a pastor in, uh, in Texas. I can't remember the city. But he was a man that really, God moved in his heart and really helped the body of Christ in the 80s to really get spurred on in prayer. Uh, his name was Dr. Larry Lee. I don't know what he's doing today, but uh, God really moved in his heart, moved in his church. He started off with just a handful of people. It grew to be, I think, 12,000 people uh, back in Texas. And, and it was all birthed because of prayer. The people prayed. Every day they gathered together and prayed. And he, uh, by God's grace and by the leading of the Lord, he wrote all sorts of uh, things about the Lord's Prayer and broke the Lord's Prayer down. Now, I've, I've made it a little bit different than what he had. Uh, but the essential truths are still there because they came from the Spirit of God. And there was a real revival of prayer in the 80s amongst many uh, churches uh, that really made a difference. But like all revivals, after a while they begin to wane because the people of God get comfortable again. Is everybody with me here today? But I believe God wants to revive our hearts in this area of prayer again. And so these six parts of prayer, and all this is going to be on the internet, on the website uh, later, so you won't be able to copy these things down because you've already discovered that I talk too fast, you're not going to be able to get it that fast. Amen? <laughs> and because my time is limited, but because I talk fast many times, then you get, you know, double for your money and you get, you know, blessed more and all. Uh, anyway. All right, so six parts of this prayer. Number one, our relationship. Notice he starts it off by our Father which art in heaven, right? Everybody say our Father. Our Father. And so it starts off, the first part of the prayer is our Father really emphasizing relationship with God. Prayer without relationship is just a bunch of words. And then secondly, giving reverence and praise. He says our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be your name. We're going to talk about those two today. I'll give you the rest of the six, though. We're going to just deal with those two first ones today because that's all the time we have. Thirdly, the focus and priority of prayer is your kingdom come, your will be done. And so the focus and the priority of our prayers ought to be the, the extension of God's kingdom and, and the believing for God's will to be done in our lives personally and in our lives uh, nationally and in the world. We want God's will be done. Jesus even prayed to, uh, to the Father, not my will, Father, but your will be done. That means your prayer and my prayer as well. Do you know if I was going to go by my will in life, I wouldn't be here today? That's the absolute truth. 
If I was going to follow my will, I wouldn't be here today. I'm not saying I've been perfect in all aspects of following God's will, but I do know this, that if I was going to follow my will, one of two things would be the case. I would be a forest ranger. Maybe one of three uh, things would be the case. I would be a forest ranger probably in the state of New York. And, uh, or I would be retired because working for the state, you can retire by the time you're 55. <laughs> Boy, that sounds good. Or thirdly, I'd be dead because if you don't follow the will of God, you don't know if you're going to live as long as you normally would. Isn't that right? And so out of those three, the retirement sounds the best. But anyway, all right. But again, the idea is the focus and the priority of prayer is your kingdom come, God, and your will uh, be done in my life. Fourthly, appropriating God's provision in prayer. Give us this day our daily bread. God's provision. He is the provider. Again, breaking this down. Again, understanding that this is a model prayer to give guidance. It's like a skeleton. It's like an outline in order to help us uh, look beyond the actual words into uh, maybe more of what God's intention was. Uh, when he inspired Jesus, when Jesus uh, spoke these things. Amen? And then number five, appropriating God's forgiveness and forgiving others. Forgive us this day. Forgive us our trespasses or our deaths as we forgive others. And so appropriating God's forgiveness and forgiving others. And then sixthly, acknowledging God's deliverance and protection. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us uh, from evil. And so we're going to look at, in the next couple of weeks, we're going to look at the Lord's Prayer in light of it being a model prayer and how we might apply it to our lives, uh, not as a repetitious prayer, but as a, a prayer uh, that helps guide us into the directions uh, that God may have us go in prayer that is far beyond just those words. Words uh, that are recorded. Are, are, is everybody all right here this morning? All right, so in the little bit of time that we have right now, we're going to focus on these two. Our Father and hallowed be your name. Those two aspects, relationship and giving reverence and praise as we approach God in prayer. All right, so let's kick it right in there. First of all, verse 9, he starts off this prayer. Our Father in heaven. Relationship is the key, the principle of relationship. Turn with me if you don't mind. We might uh, come back to Matthew. We may not. Uh, we'll refer to it certainly, but you can hold your place if you want to. But let's go to John uh, chapter 16. Everybody alive and well? John chapter 16, beginning with verse 23. John 16 and verse 23. This is reading the red, if you have a red, red letter edition. Verse 23, it reads this way. Are you there? I still hear pages. Love hearing those pages, though. It's a whole lot better than these little beep sounds that you make when you turn on your electronic Bible. See, I have a real Bible. You, you have an electronic Bible, maybe. All right? All right. Anyway. John 16, be quiet, lady, this is my turn to talk. She's talking about how she's got the Bible on her phone. There's a problem with that, though. She forgets to charge your phone. You forget to charge your phone, no Bible. I have my Bible no matter what. This Bible's always charged, hallelujah. All right, amen. <laughs> amen, all right. See that, you know. All right. <laughs> Verse 23, Jesus said, And in that day you will ask me nothing. Most assuredly I say to you, whatever you ask the Father in my name, he will give you. Until now you have asked nothing in my name. Ask and you will receive that your joy may be full. And so again, in relationship, Jesus says, pray to the Father. He said to his disciples, you're not going to ask me anything in that day. You're going to go directly to the Father. How many of you know Jesus made a way for us to go directly to the Father? Aren't you glad? Amen. And really, when, when talking about this, it has to do with our covenant, a covenant that Jesus ratified by his blood, that now has made it possible for us to have access with God, that has made it possible, as Hebrews said in Hebrews chapter 4, that we can come boldly to the throne of grace to obtain mercy and to find grace to help in time of need. Because of the blood. Now we can have confidence and we can be bold and, and come before our Heavenly Father without any sense of shame, without any sense of uh, inferiority complex because Christ has made us worthy uh, to come to the throne of grace in prayer before God. What an honor that is. Amen. Amen. And yet what a what an opportunity we do not take so many times to do this kind of thing. Notice what Ephesians 2, 19 says. The Amplified Bible reads this way. Therefore you are no longer outsiders. Speaking to you, say, I'm not an outsider. 
You are no longer an outsider. Exiles, migrants, and aliens excluded from the rights of citizens. But you now share citizenship with the saints. God's own people consecrated and set apart for himself. And you belong to God's own household. Say, I belong belong. to the household of God. God. Talking about family, aren't we? That word household means a relative or a family. You are part of the family of God when you accept Jesus as your Lord and Savior. One of my favorite verses, 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 23, reads this way. It says this, Being born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible, by the Word of God, which lives and abides forever. You and I have been born again by the incorruptible seed of our Heavenly Father. You see, like the analogy of a human father, when he imparts his seed uh, to his wife, there is life that begins in the womb of that wife. Isn't that right? Our Heavenly Father has a seed, and that seed is His living Word. And when we heard the gospel message, when we heard the seed of God's Word, and we believed it, we believed it, and it was conceived in our hearts, and it brought forth the life of God on the inside of us. And so now we have the divine nature. We're part, we, we are partakers of the divine nature of God. When we say He's our Father, we mean it. He is our Father. We are related to Him by the Spirit of God, regenerating us and making us new and having us born into the kingdom of God and called born again. Amen? Amen. A spiritual birth. He is literally our spiritual Father with the DNA or the divine nature, if you will, of Almighty God on the inside of us. And so the fatherhood of God, it means so many things. And I just want to give these things to you real quickly because i got so much to say. I don't have time to say it all as usual. All right? And so the fatherhood of God. Father denotes the fact that it is His choice, not ours, that we are His children at all. Say it's His choice. In John 15, 16, we're not going to go there, but it talks about how uh, Jesus uh, speaking, uh, you know, saying this. He says, "Uh, you have not chosen me, but I have chosen you. I want you to know you're chosen today. You're one of God's chosen ones. He chose you to be his son and his daughter. Now that is not talking about the idea that God chooses some to be and some not to be. All I'm saying is that now you believe down Christ. You are amongst his chosen, aren't you? And so again... It's his choice. And then father, nextly, father denotes a loving relationship, not merely servanthood, a loving relationship. He's called in 2 Corinthians 1.3, the father of mercies. He loves us uh, with an unconditional kind of love, far beyond what we could ever imagine, this kind of love. His forgiveness is an amazing forgiveness. He's ever ready to forgive, the scripture says. Father also has the idea of God being our father means we have an inheritance. Everybody say an inheritance. You are an heir of God. Romans 8, 17 says we are heirs of God and joint heirs with Jesus Christ. And this again not only relates to him being our father, having an inheritance because he's our father, but it also has to do with covenant because one of the meanings of covenant is that of a will and a testament. And remember this, though I know some of you know it, we need to reiterate it in our hearts and minds again. The New Testament is called the last will and testament of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. And in that will, he tells you what's he, what he's left you. What he's left you uh, because of the fact that he died for you. He died and left you an inheritance, didn't he? Yeah. Say, I'm an heir of God and a joint heir with Jesus Christ. Now think about this then. Can you not have more power in prayer when you know that you're a son, a daughter of God, that you're in covenant with Him, that you have an inheritance? Uh, the idea that you have an inheritance helps to give you boldness to ask for that which he says is yours. All based on that thing. I remember many years ago when I first went to Bible school, and that was, that was a long time ago. Back in 1980 and 81, when I first went to Bible school, I remember one of the first things they taught me is that the covenant that we have with God is the primary foundation for answered prayer. It's the primary foundation for answered prayer because we're in relationship with Him. Again, ratified, signed by the blood of Jesus that it's yours. Amen. So important for us to know. The fatherhood of God. Our Father who, are, who is in heaven. Our Father who is in heaven. If He is our Father, then He will correct us. He loves those. He corrects those, rather, that He loves. A Father provides for His children, doesn't He? Matthew 6, 25-34. We read verse 32, I think it was. Uh, but it talks about Him providing. In Philippians four nineteen, And my God shall supply all your need according to His riches and glory by Christ Jesus. A good father provides for his children. Knowing Him as Father gives you a confident boldness. 
And so important for prayer. Now, along with this idea of fatherhood also comes friendship, the friendship of God. And the reason why I mention that is because, you know, somebody can be a father, but it doesn't make them a friend. But, you know, your heavenly father is not only your father, he's also your friend. Jesus said that greater love has no man than this. Then he laid down his life for his friends. And then he said to his disciples and to you and me that you are my friends. Amen. And friendship in the Bible usually has to do with, again, covenant. Abraham was called the friend of God. It was a covenant terminology for them in that ancient time. God is a father who's also a friend. Abraham was called the friend of God. Definition of a friend, a loved one, a dear one, a partner, a comrade, a person you share with. How many of you know God wants to share in your life? You know, we are not what people call deists. I don't know if you know the difference between a deist and a theist. A theist is a believer in God. A deist believes in God, but a deist believes that God is way out there and has nothing to do with people or His creation. We are not deists. We don't believe God is way out there and has nothing to do with His people. We believe that our God is a God who is a friend who we share our lives with and He shares Himself with us, don't we? Amen. That's the way our lives are supposed to be, not living this life on our own. So a person you know, like and trust, one who is allied with you in your struggles, one who fights on your side. All these meanings are the meanings of the word friend. How about you? I love that part. God fights on my side. Because he's a friend, amen? And if God be for us, who can be against us, amen? And so sometimes we have the idea in prayer that we're struggling with God. We're trying to squeeze him enough in prayer. We're trying to pester him enough in prayer until he gives us that which we're asking for. But that's not the case. When we're asking God in prayer for that which is already according to the inheritance, you can't just ask anything. You have to ask according to his word, right? The inheritance when we do that, we're not, we're, not, it's not, we're not changing God's will to give something to us. We are appropriating what He already has said is His will in our lives and reaching out in faith to receive it. All right? And so this is some basic things about our relationship, our Father. Now, let's talk about the next part, giving reverence and praise. Hallowed be thy name or hallowed be your name. Now, the word hallowed is an interesting word. Let, let's talk about the word hallowed. Are, are you doing all right so far? All right, we're going to be done soon. Don't worry. Soon, like a couple hours. All right? The word hallowed means to be sanctified or set apart. It's related to the word holy. It means to be praised and to be adored. And so get the picture right now, just to uh, help you a little bit. When you begin to pray, you begin to magnify the Father God. You remind yourself, oh, Father, I thank you uh, that you are my daddy. I thank you that I'm born into your family. We begin to thank him. We begin to thank him uh, that we have an inheritance in God, uh, that now I can come boldly to the throne of grace because by the blood of Jesus, I now have access to you, Father. We believe to, we begin by saying those things, speaking in line with the Word of God, reminding ourselves of our relationship with our Heavenly Father. And then this hallowed be thy name. We begin to uh, praise Him. We begin to adore Him. We begin to express to Him our love and, and our, and our uh, appreciation for all that He's done. Now when it says hallowed be thy name, the name of the Father... And of course, the Lord Jesus Christ, Jesus, the name Jesus. Most of you probably know it's the, you know, the Greek form of Yeshua or Joshua it means God saves. How many of you know Jesus is the Savior? He's Jehovah who saves. Amen? And so the Jesus of the New Testament is the Jehovah of the Old Testament, right? Now those that are called themselves Jehovah's Witnesses, now they don't believe that, but it's the truth anyway. We worship Jehovah when we worship Jesus, don't we? All right, and so with these ideas of names, the ideas of names, the Lord Jehovah, I want to give you eight names real quickly. As you're in prayer, remembering that Jesus is our Redeemer, eight names of God found in the Old Testament that are really expressions of who Jesus is in this new covenant that we're in. Are you with me here? Because this is so important. This is all part of prayer. Uh, you know, as you begin to pray, you remind yourself of your relationship with God. You begin to remind yourself in praise of what God has done for you. You praise Him for it. You thank Him for it. This is all part of prayer. You don't just go immediately to the Father and you begin to say, Father, I want this, that, and the other thing. You know, if you had a child, uh, you know, let's say you're a little girl, because little girls tend to really get to father sometimes, you know, because they try to be, they try to sweeten him up, you know. And they'll come and they'll say, they'll sit on his lap, give him a kiss and say, Daddy, I love you. Of course, us earthly fathers, we know, okay, something's coming. 
But you know, if they just sat there, they know better. Don't they? They, they just sat there and said, Daddy, I want this, that, and the other thing. No, first they need to love on you a little bit, right? Soften your heart a little bit. The analogy breaks down, but nevertheless, I think you got the idea. Our Heavenly Father doesn't want us just coming just asking for things. He wants us to love Him and love Him genuinely from all of our hearts. Appreciating, appreciating who He is, not just what He has done or can do for our lives. All right, and so first of all, this name be hard to uh, pronounce, probably, but Jehovah Sidkenu means the Lord is our righteousness. The Lord is our righteousness. Comes from Jeremiah 23, 6. In his days, Judah will be saved, and Israel will dwell safely. Now, this is his name by which he will be called the Lord our righteousness. The Lord our righteousness. Say, He is my righteousness. In 1 Corinthians 1.30, but of him you are in Christ Jesus who became for us wisdom from God and righteousness and sanctification and redemption. I don't have the passage, but 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 21 says, He who knew no sin was made to be sin for us that we might be made the righteousness of God in Christ. 2 Corinthians 5 and verse 21. I, I share that with you because again, we're hallowing his name. Father, I thank you in your prayer time. Father, I thank you that Jesus is my righteousness. I thank you uh, that that means that now I'm justified in your sight. That means I'm innocent in your sight. Isn't the idea of righteousness an important part of approaching God in prayer? Being conscious of the fact that you're in right standing with God is part of righteousness. Being conscious of the fact that you're acquitted in the courts of heaven, that your sins have been washed away. It helps you to have confidence and boldness as you approach God in prayer. So reminding yourself in the, in, in the sense of praising God for Jesus, you're my righteousness. You're my right standing. You're the one who has made me innocent because and praising Him Amen. for the fact that He has made you righteous. You're hallowing the name Jehovah Sidkenu or the Lord my righteousness. And you go through these things. Jehovah M. Kadesh means the Lord who sanctifies. Comes from Leviticus 28. And you shall keep my statutes and perform them. I am the Lord who sanctifies you. Lord, I thank you as I approach in prayer that I've been sanctified which means I've been set apart. I've been made pure and clean in your sight. I thank you that Jesus is my sanctification. That he is my holiness. And I thank you. I, I praise your name. Uh, Jehovah uh, Jehovah M. Kadesh. Jehovah over my sanctification, my holiness. I praise your name today. Amen. I thank you for doing that for me. And the scripture, same one we used for the previous Sidkenu or righteousness, but of him you are in Christ Jesus. Notice it says, who became for us wisdom from God, righteousness and sanctification and redemption. And then another name, the third one, Jehovah Rapha, the Lord that heals. Amen. Amen. Exodus 15, 26. This is to Israel, but Jesus of the New Testament is Jehovah of the Old. I want you to know Jesus is Jehovah Rapha. Jesus is Jehovah Rapha. He is the Lord that heals. It says in Exodus 15, 26, and said, if you diligently heed the voice of the Lord your God and do what is right in His sight, give ear to His commandments and keep all His statutes, I put none of these diseases on you, which I brought on the Egyptians, for I am the Lord who heals you. Say, He is the Lord who heals me. And so you know you're getting ready. You're coming before the throne of God and you're coming boldly to the throne of grace and you're thanking Him. You're hallowing His name. You're hallowing the name of Jehovah Rapha. Lord, I thank You that You are my healer, that You're my Jehovah Rapha, that Jesus died and, and bore the penalty for my sin and therefore sickness and by His stripes I'm the healed of the Lord. I thank You, Jehovah Rapha, Jesus my healer. And you begin to rejoice in that as you pray. But you see, to pray this, you're hallowing His name. You're not in a hurry in your prayer life. People wonder sometimes, well, how did Jesus say to His disciples, you know, could you not tarry for one hour? And it's hard to conceive of the idea of praying for one hour. But you can see already, we've only approached two parts to the six parts of this, uh, this Lord's Prayer, and already we could, have spent, we could have spent a good hour or maybe half an hour just hallowing His name, just adoring His name, praising His name. And I want you to know when you're done doing that, you're going to feel it. You're going to feel, man, you're going to feel something different. Yeah. Jehovah Ra is the Lord is my shepherd. How many of you know Jesus is your shepherd? What is a shepherd but someone who looks after and protects the flock? God is always watching over us. 1 Peter 2.25, for, for you were as sheep going astray, but are now returned unto the shepherd and bishop of your souls. And so in your praising and hallowing of his name, you remind yourself, Jesus, you're my shepherd. 
You guide me. You protect me. You keep me safe. And I thank you. I, I adore you, Lord God. I thank you for being that for me. That's, that's number four. And then number five, we're hallowing his name. Hallowed be your name, Lord. Hallowed be your name. And then number five, Jehovah Jireh is the Lord that sees and provides. The idea is that he looks ahead and makes provision. Abraham discovered this uh, when he had taken his son up to the mount uh, in order to sacrifice his son as God had commanded. And yet God had already kind of placed it in Abraham's heart some kind of faith because he said the Lord will provide a lamb. He will provide. And the Lord did provide. He saw ahead and he provided a ram that was stuck in the thicket in order to be sacrificed. And so it says, and Abraham called the name of that place the Lord will provide. As it is said to this day in the mount of the Lord, it shall be provided. Amen. And so in our preparing our hearts and praying, we begin to say, Father, I thank you that you are my provider, that you are my provision. You are the one who is my Jehovah Jireh, my Jehovah Yira, the Lord who looks ahead and makes provision. He looks ahead. He knows your future. He knows what you need tomorrow. We already saw scripture that says he knows what you have need of before you ask. He knows what you need of 10 years from now. He knows what you need. You know, some of you are thinking, well, I need a, a wife or I need a husband. The Lord looks ahead. He knows you need a wife or a husband. But can you trust him? Or are you going to try to make it happen on your own? See, Abraham was promised a son. And Abraham got impatient, didn't he? And so his wife Sarah said, well, maybe, maybe the Lord wants Hagar to be the one that bears your son. And so Abraham, he didn't miss a lick. He said, I think that's a great idea. And so he goes and has relationships with Hagar, and he births an Ishmael. And Ishmael caused nothing but problems. When you try to birth something God has for you in your own power and in your own flesh, you're asking for trouble, aren't you? But if you'll wait and you'll be patient, You'll end up and you'll get the son of promise. You get the promise of fulfilled in your life like Abraham and Sarah finally did miraculously. I mean, they had gotten so old, uh, they thought it could never happen now. Maybe you're thinking, man, I'm getting old, man. I'm 26. I'm too old. I'm getting old. I'm getting old, God. I need a wife. I need a, I need a husband. I'm 26, Lord. Well, the older you get, the more miracle it will be. Amen? Amen. 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 Where do these things come from? Anyway, all right. Say, he's my provider. provider. Amen. Just a minute. My my, uh, thing messed up here a little bit. There we go. We got it. All right. God is still the Lord that sees and provides. Philippians 4, 9, Matthew 6. Uh, You can write those things down. All right. We just got a few more to go. Three more to go. Everybody's good, right? Jehovah Shalom. Say, the Lord is my peace. We're hallowing your name, Lord. Thank you, Lord. You are my shalom. You're my peace. You're the one that gives me this peace that passes all understanding. Again, we're hallowing his name and reminding ourselves of God, who he is, and how he has provided in our lives, even described in his names that describe facets of his character. It says in Judges 6, this is where it comes from. Then the Lord said to him, peace be with you. Do not fear. You shall not die. Say, you shall not die. You shall not die. So Gideon built an altar there to the Lord and called it the Lord is peace. To this day, it is still an offer of the Abyssalites. And so again, this idea, Jesus said, John 14, 27, peace I leave with you, my peace I give to you. Do not let, you know, I don't give like the world gives. Do not let your heart be troubled, neither be afraid. This peace of God. We're hallowing the name of Jehovah Shalom. We're worshiping and adoring him for who he is uh, in our lives. All part of hallowing be his name. And there can be more. Jehovah Shammah, the Lord is present. Ezekiel 48, 35 reads, All the way around shall be 18,000 cubits, and the name of the city from that day shall be the Lord is there. We can thank Him in our prayer. We can say, God, I hallow the name of Jehovah Shammah. Lord, you're here with me. You're here with me. I thank you for your presence. I thank you for filling me with your spirit afresh today, Father God. Thank you for your presence. In Hebrews uh, chapter 13, 5 on the screen, it says, Let your conduct be without covetousness. Be content in such things as you have. For he himself has said, I will never leave you nor forsake me. Say, he'll never leave me. He'll never forsake me. And then the last name I'm going to give you, and there's other names of God. There's many names of God. And certainly you wouldn't go through all of these necessarily, but you're reminding yourself and hallowing the name of God, reminding yourself of His character, and really in doing so, you're reminding yourself of how He feels about you, what He wants for your life. He wants peace. He wants healing. He wants His presence to manifest in your life. 
The last one is Jehovah Nisi is the Lord my banner or the Lord my victory is the idea. And Moses built an altar and called its name, the Lord is my banner. 2 Corinthians 2.14 says, Now thanks be to God who always, everybody say always, always, who always leads us in triumph in Christ and through us diffuses the fragrance of His knowledge in every place. And so here we have eight names of God. Eight names of God that we can hallow, that we can praise, that we can adore as we're really in many ways preparing our hearts to pray. And again, we're talking about, first of all, our relationship with God. We're our Father who is in heaven. Our Father who loves us unconditionally. Our Father who provides for His children. Our Father who has made, it, made us uh, 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 in covenant with Him through the blood of Jesus. Our Father who has made us heirs of God and joint heirs with Jesus Christ. And so our Father who is Jehovah, Sid Canoe, Jehovah M. Kadesh, Jehovah Rapha, Jehovah Nisi, all of those. We praise you and we hallow, we adore your name. And by doing these things, it helps us to prepare our hearts in prayer, helps us spend time with him. Amen? Amen. It's this form of communion with God. And so next time we're going to get into more of these, these six aspects of the Lord's Prayer and how we can apply these things to our life. I'm not saying this is the only way you can apply, but these are ways we can apply prayer in our lives. And really, I'll tell you, back in the 80s, I began to apply these things, and it changed everything for me. And it can change. Again, don't make it a ritual. Don't make it something that doesn't contain life. But when it contains life, when it's got the life of God, it can change our lives. Amen? Amen. Would you stand with me? Let's just uh, worship God for a moment. The worship team would come.